Representative Henry Rivera, but before I do, I uh, just wanted to make an announcement. Obviously, we're here in Valentine uh, on behalf of our president, Summer Webb, Mayor of Valentine. She could not join us uh, for the meeting in Valentine for a very good reason. Uh, her, her daughter had her baby yesterday, and so in Rudoso. So uh, I told everybody I cannot compete with a baby. It's just not going to happen. So with that being said, uh, the illustrious city representative, Henry DiMetta, has uh, graciously offered to step in and serve as our chair for the meeting today. So that is the reason why you do not see Summer Web today. All right? We're stuck with you. You're stuck. <laughs> We're stuck with Henry DiMetta. There you go. for the pledge of allegiance. And I do have, let me do that real quick. Give me a second. Uh, da -da -da -da. Where did we go? Here's our. Oops, I'm sorry, one second, hold on one moment. Let me duplicate. Okay. Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First of all, uh, before I add a uh, roll call, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, before I, before we take roll call, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Judge Evans, Commissioner Davis, and Commissioner Albert Miller for the hosting this meeting out here in Valentine today, and then Marfa, we were there last night. And so, uh, thank you very much. Hey. I'd also like to make an announcement saying, uh, to let y'all know that Ms. Teresa Todd is here today of our legal. She's uh, from Presidio Jeff uh, Davis County uh, legal. So we are legal for today. Thank hey. you. And of course, uh, the Sonette stole the thunder on 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 congratulating uh, President uh, Chair Webb on her being her first granddaughter, being a grandma officially. Thank you all. Great. Now we'll have roll call. We'll go by table. So we'll start off with the table to my left. We can go ahead and identify. Uh, introduce yourself, please. Good morning, uh, Art Piero. Judge Curtis Evans, Jeff Davis County. And Big and Big Lou. And Lou. <laughs> I'm uh, Rafael Padilla, Horizon City, Alderman, and I'm a proxy for Sheriff Wiles. Melissa? Good evening, Cynthia, Cobb Staff, Sheriff Wiles, and I'm a proxy for And Dad, Dora, come on. Dora, you got to introduce yourself. <laughs> Robert? Thank you. Um, let's see, Elmer Miller. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Uh, let's see, Dr. Mena? Go ahead, Judge Portillo. Jose Portillo, Presidio County.
Commissioner Bruce Rapani, Proxy Chair of Summer Road. Yes, thank you. And Judge Diaz? Carlos Diaz, Public County Judge. Uh, Annette Gutierrez, Rio Grande Council Governments. And Henry Vera, uh, First Vice, <laughs> First Vice <laughs> President, also represented from the City of El Paso. Thank you, sir. Okay, that's what happened when we said. I, I, if you want to, you can. It's no, okay. no, 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 it's okay. Yes, you don't have to. Uh, we, we're right across. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, next is the approval of, me of the meetings uh, previously held on March 17, 2023. Oh, April 28th. I'm sorry. March. Oh, I, I apologize on the agenda. It should have been um, April 28, 2023. <laughs> I apologize. Anybody opposed? I mean, uh, anybody have any questions on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion passes. Any public comments? Uh, we um, public comments. We do have some guests. I don't know if anybody would want to um, uh, say anything. We do have Mr. Newsom representing the hospital <laughs> district. Um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to announce to us in terms of some of the activities you're doing out in your area. Are you okay? I put you on the spot or no? No, he's, he's good at public. Uh, don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Dad, is there anything you'd like to report out for Workforce Solutions? Okay. Okay. Thank you all very much for your comments. We'll move to administration and Ms. Gutierrez will take uh, this one. Yes, and I apologize. We, um, Representative Rivera pointed out that there's um, some disconnect with my presentation slides and the agenda, but we're gonna go on to um, the enterprise presentation. And so uh, we have here today, Sarah Garth, as well as Ryan Stern, and they're from Enterprise Commute Program. And the idea behind what they're going to propose to you all, or just to inform you, is um, a program that's offered as a large carpool service. And it is where we can connect um, government to uh, employees and we, uh, as a government could help provide a subsidy uh, for that carpool expense. And so in Culberson County, uh, it has been used to a great extent at Blue Origin. And so this was a, an initiative that first came upon our region through the Border Patrol with uh, their carpooling activities, primarily in Hetzworth County. So um, just by coincidence, we have some transportation discussions going on with our agenda today. And so uh, hopefully, perhaps I might have something to do to say with the multimodal study that's going to be discussed by TxDOT and Barracuda in a few minutes. So I'll go ahead and bring up Sarah and Ryan so they can talk about the program, or Sarah's going to do that. And I'll go ahead and uh, just let me know when you want me to forward the slides. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to come talk to you today. Um, thank you, Annette, for teeing it up for me. Um, what I just want to share a little bit about is how we um, in our private partnerships provide grants as well as public agreements because I know that's the reason. The first thing I want to talk about is what is a van? So, really quick, a van pool operates exactly like a large park. You can help identify folks that live near one another and work the same shift. And then that group of folks can decide what type of vehicle they want to ride in, where they want to meet up, what time they want Meet up or you know, one of to, and then they would use that to look at work, bring the benefits of having a, a um, 
reliable transportation mode as well as money back into their pocket and time back into their pocket. So when we provide those what we do is provide that turnkey vehicle service with the vehicle and everything that's required to operate in the So we would provide anywhere from the status to the 15 class of this vehicle, and then insurance, maintenance, roadside assistance, a local operations team to support that vehicle and make sure that that's operating um, with 100%. So we go to the next one. So we would also, with our public sector partner, provide a digital interface with our online platform and mobile app, and that would allow vehicle owners to record their miles and keep up on the metrics on their vehicle. And we would also provide online and in to help um, market the program and engage some of the So why vehicle matters in public transit? It's not the one and only solution for everything, but it's a really important part in being able to reach some of those transit deserts in areas where folks don't have access to fixed route service. So when we enter into a partnership with a public agency, we would decide upon a subsidy that the people would be able to provide to buy down the cost of the van pools to the end users. And we would take that whole amount, in this example, it's 600 because that's right now the industry average. We would take that entire amount and apply it directly to the final invoice to the van pool groups. And then the remainder would be either the responsibility of the van poolers themselves or of the employer if that employer wanted to be financially involved. So this is an example of the different public sector partnerships that we have across the district right now. Um, we have them in extremely rural areas, extremely populated urban areas, and everywhere in between. There's a fit center. Step three more. So this is just some impact that I did. Um, we've been able to help save almost half a billion dollars um, for computing instead of driving. Environment, quantifiable environmental impact. <laughs> um, and then, last but not least, and figuring out ways to and to make sure that everyone that you access, which is a way to also reach a more modern workforce and have an opportunity for those folks that are um, working a hybrid shift to be able to utilize the manual service. And for the days that they need it. And then the last slide is just what, what a public-private public partnership would look like at the next, next stage when we want it to move forward. So um, we would want to define what the program looks like, how much subsidy would be, all of those details, and then whether besides go to do a pilot program or go out to a public procurement, um, we have a really robust launch process that we would help make sure the program lifts off and becomes successful. We can those miles that you the information if that's what you wanted to report. And then we can just help reach some of those folks in the Rio Grande area that need that kind of transportation to help get them to the jobs that they need. Okay. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. And one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, when we did meet with Sarah and and um, Sean is actually out of the El Paso office. Sarah's in Kentucky. And so um <laughs> If this is something that might be of interest to our counties and cities, but maybe this is not the administrative function you want to take on, the Council of Governments can look into serving that for you. So um, the idea would be that our service area would be the coverage that could be utilized for the uh, Van Pool program. So uh, we initially thought that there might be some um, possibility of uh, the school districts. Maybe there's some uh, folks out of El Paso who are teaching in Fort Hancock or teaching in Del City or Sierra Blanca or vice versa. Uh, and if they didn't know about this program, this is, can be one way that they can uh, create some savings for themselves in terms of their transportation costs. And I don't, we never discussed this, but knowing, uh, just having uh, the council governments be more involved in public transit for the local governments corporation, I wonder if there's anything where individuals have to be working in order to access the service, right? They couldn't miss, because there's a lot of 
um, young adults out in the rural areas of El Paso who would need to get to UTEP, but they may not have a reliable vehicle. And right. so that might be a better <clears throat> workaround for them to get to the university as opposed to going on tra public transit. The vehicle might be a feasible option for them. I know drivers have to be at the so oftentimes it's for college age students. Um, we do have enterprise as a comfort testing services that we can look into to help provide that service. That's just probably not a good Okay. A good question. Are there any questions? Any questions? Huh? Ideas, thoughts? This is strictly for workforce. Yes. This is strictly for nurses and things like that. That could be a possibility. Yeah. So yeah, as as um, your medical providers, if that's maybe an incentive they want to offer, um, that's something that we could look at doing in terms of incorporating this program. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Right. We appreciate thank it. You guys. Thank and you. um, and I do have Sarah's information, and and we'll be sending that out to you all, so you can you can see that information as well. Before we move on to item number two, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Mayor uh, Ivy Avalos from Socorro, Mayor, uh, the city of Socorro. Hi, Mayor, sir. <laughs> welcome. Sorry. Hi. Item number two, also, uh, this is recognition of contributions made by Rodrigo Estrada. By yes. Sunday Gutierrez. Thank you, sir. So um, I think most of you all in this room know who Rodrigo Estrada is. He is the former district uh, director for U.S. Congressman Tony Gonzalez. And he is, um, he wasn't able to join us today because he is, I think, in London at this time, uh, visiting some friends out there. But he is, uh, I think he's left such a great impact in the short amount of time that he was with us um, coming back home from um, school, uh, from college at University of Chicago. So if you all will indulge me, I have a, uh, just maybe a 15 minute video uh, since he wasn't able to join us. We just did a few, um, we had a, a just a, I like to liken it to something of a uh, a story core. Hopefully that would maybe make the uh, the cut or not. But I just wanted to take these few minutes for you all to just hear some reflections from Rodrigo. All right, Rodrigo. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this short video with oh, us. Oh, one second. Able to join us for the quarter. Let me. There you go. Is that good now? Okay. Let me that one meeting in July. And so I thought it would be appropriate for us to record this video to have an opportunity to recognize you for all of the accomplishments that you've made, as well as the partnerships and friendships that you've garnered along the way during this short time with us. So I'm going to go ahead and get into it with you. I just want to remind everyone what positions you've held um, since you've come back to El Paso, uh, just as a reminder for everyone. So the first time that I came across you was in um, was at a commissioner's court meeting online during the pandemic. You were being recognized for your internship and all that you had done uh, while you were with them. And um, this was after you had graduated from University of Chicago with your economics degree. And I was really impressed with you, um, just the way that you carried yourself as well as the interactions you had with um, staff. And so I thought, wow, this guy's gonna do great things. I wonder where he'll be. And so, lo and behold, shortly thereafter, uh, you started working at the Economic Development Administration at the Austin Regional Office. And so that was with um, Mr. Jorge Ayala. And so you were able to come back to our area and work specifically with the CARES funding that was made available. And so, again, I was impressed with you during that time because you quickly manned up groups, agencies where they could work together in partnerships that maybe they hadn't envisioned before. And so uh, we, you and I did see a lot of um, return on investment because of those um, strategy sessions that you had created. And so um, I thought that was, you know, what a great, what a great thing he's done. I wonder where he'll go. Then after that, here you are uh, landing in May of 2022 as the regional district director for U.S. Uh, Congressman Tony Gonzalez, District 23. And I think that that position that you had is probably going to be the one that has left the most indelible mark uh, on all of us in terms of what you were able to accomplish. And so what I want to do now is just take a little bit of time to just kind of have you uh, give you the opportunity to reflect on, on your time 
in this region and what are some most memorable uh, events for you. But I think the question that I would want to ask first, which might be on the minds of others, is why did you choose to come back to our region after having graduated from the University of Chicago? Well, first and foremost, that thank you to you and to the board for your gratitude and for being great partners uh, as I served both for at EDA and for Congressman Tony Gonzalez this past year. Uh, so thank you uh, for helping me along my journey and mentoring me as well. And to your question, uh, many in my cohort, many high school graduates around where I grew up, uh, never thought they'd come back to uh, the region, to El Paso, uh, or to Bayman's where I went to high school. You know, we were often told that the only way to succeed was to get out and fast. And I rejected that notion. And I wanted to come back and I recognize the potential here in the borderland and the need. And that was heightened for me during the pandemic while I was interning for Judge Samaniego, who was a dear man, uh, friend and mentor. Uh, it solidified my passion for service. Uh, and it opened doors for me to come back after graduating from the University of Chicago with my bachelor's in economics and master's in international relations. And I was fortunate to find an opportunity with EDA. Uh, as you may know, EDA was one of the lead organizations administering CARES Act funding, ARPA funding. And so we were really where the action was. And I was fortunate to be selected as an economic development specialist at EDA. And I administered a portfolio of grants, which included both New Mexico, the entire state, and West Texas. It was an exciting time. I got to administer projects in my own community, including the Bayman's Aerospace uh, Economic Recovery Grant, uh, as well as helping um, to score uh, and with the selection for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge that El Paso was a recipient of. And so it was an exciting time, and it uh, highlighted for me the progress that was happening here in Portland, as well as the long-term needs that we have to work uh, in terms of trying to get the community to be sustainable and resilient post-pandemic. As you may know, I'll pass this in areas in the entire country when it came to COVID-19, and I didn't want to abandon my community during this time of great esteem. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I started my internship with Jeff Samaniego, we found a similar note uh, just weeks after the El Paso shooting. And so it was an opportunity for me to really see the community firsthand, a uh, real from the tragedy, uh, and really come together during a time of need. And that's been a continual threat for me during these past few years here in El Paso. Well, it, that's, uh, again, that's quite remarkable uh, for you to have been able to, um, as you look back uh, in your life profession that you were you were present during um, two significant events in our, in, in our, in the nation, the shootings as well as the, as the pandemic. So um, I wonder how much that's going to frame your, your life professionally moving forward. So if I can also ask you, what would you consider to be one of your most favorite memories professionally since coming back to our area? Well, there are so many. And as I look through the photo slides that you prepared, it's all coming back to the nostalgia really hitting in because we've done a lot. Uh, and I should say this wasn't just solitary journey. You know, leadership is never uh, one person. This was really a, a collaborative group effort. And so the memories that I have are shared along other leaders, uh, really through co-leadership uh, in different organizations. But just a few that come to mind, I think what we were able to do with the Bayman's Veterans Memorial uh, is a textbook example of what interlocal collaboration should look like. And I had so much fun working on that project. It wasn't easy and it took several months, uh, but for me, that was the first deliverable that I could claim for my community. And it was quite a sizable one at that. It's a nine hundred thousand dollar EDA grant with around two million in matching funding from the county. And so we all came together, and it really, for me, uh, restored my hope and faith in government that we can still accomplish big things for our community that have a tangible effect. And one of the last memories that I had, the most recent memories before maybe, was the uh, Mission Trail celebration. Uh, as you may know, uh, we worked very hard on trying to highlight our historic cultural heritage assets along the Mission Trail, our two missions, and the Presidio Chapel and San Lissario. And what we've been able to do with the Mission Trail Alliance, and, and thanks to you and the NET for helping to bring our stakeholders together, uh, has been phenomenal in a short period of time, just a few months. And I know that's a project that will, you know, outlast me in this role. That's a project that I have great faith in that will continue to 
uh, be able to pull resources together and uh, apply for grants jointly in a competitive manner. Uh, but we had a celebration at the end of uh, June because the Mission Trail was recognized as the best historical site in Texas uh, by Texas Travel Awards. And so it was a great event for the community. And for me, it was really a final uh, hurrah, uh, so to speak, the culmination of our efforts to celebrate uh, with the community what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that the when you mentioned uh, the Veterans Memorial Park, I really do take away uh, that effort in terms of how it was approached because it can definitely be replicated in other manners. And so um, I appreciate you having had that foresight to just force um, organizations to the table that maybe may not have worked together previously and remind them that we're all in this together and we can accomplish great things if we are working in a united fashion. So with that being said, this might be a little bit of a duplication of what you just mentioned, but can you think of um, what would you consider one of your greatest achievements? Well, I'm only 24, so I know I have a lot left to do for the community, for the state. And so, so for me, it's building up, you know, keeping on the right trajectory, so to speak. And so, um, you know, we can point towards specific examples. I still think the famous veterans were the the greatest takeaways, uh, but we've done so much. And I think the greatest achievement is being able to bridge the divides and bring stakeholders together to the table. Um, not just to talk about collaboration, but actually to be, actually you know, put, practice what we preach, so to speak. And that's easier said than done. And it's taken you know, several um, undertakings. It's taken several times. It's taken time to actually achieve that point of meaningful collaboration. But we've done it in several respects. And the grants, a uh, strike force, as we called it, uh, great partnership with the county, with the COG, is another example of how we can actually collaborate in a substantive, meaningful manner, you know, setting aside differences, setting aside uh, any historic feuds, so to speak, and actually get stuff done in the community. That, for me, is my first and foremost priority. And so, for those who may not be aware why it is that you're no longer working with uh, Congressman Gonzalez, um, do you want to tell them what your, your next chapter is in your life so everybody knows where you will be? Yes. So, I am very blessed to be attending Harvard Law School this fall. And I owe it to a lot of my uh, mentors here in the community, uh, specifically County Judge Samaniego, who was my recommender uh, for law school when I was applying to Harvard. And so, again, for me, it's uh, it's not a, a testament to my own abilities, but it's really a uh, highlight for the community that we have such amazing talent here uh, and that we're paving the way for others to follow. And I, while I may be one of few attorneys um, from El Paso at Harvard, uh, I certainly uh, won't be the last, and I try to mentor and give back in you know, my own community, uh, mentoring high school students and now college students as well uh, from our region who want to get into public service and who want to, um, you know, realize their dreams and, and go to talk to your schools. That's something that isn't beyond reach for anyone in that possible. And so with that being said, we're not going to be seeing you for, for some time because of your studies. Uh, so with that in mind, what what is it that you want to see for our region? Uh, what what would you what, what do you envision for us now that you won't be here directly? Because you will have an eye on what's <laughs> happening, I'm sure about that, that. But what are some things that you would like to see for, for us? Yes. So I leave at Basel knowing that our community is in good hands because of many of the leaders, yourself included, at that core working tirelessly. Um, to make sure that we keep the momentum going on a lot of these projects, whether it's related to sustainability, whether it's related to uh, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, and those are really the three key sectors that I think will define uh, the region uh, for years to come. And so I'd like to see progress made on those fronts, you know, bringing manufacturing, advanced manufacturing to an possible, uh, trying to grow our West Texas Aerospace Development Corporation. Uh, and seeing that collaboration, that synergy move forward, uh, not just between our rural municipalities, but really between the city of El Paso uh, and the region itself, not just El Paso County, but our neighboring counties that God also serves. And so I feel optimistic about the future. Uh, I first and foremost hope that we can stand the brain drain so that young people like myself can <laughs> 
by their they have something to come back to. So being able to provide for their families or secure competitive employment. And so I hope to be a resource even while I'm at Harvard uh, and to contribute and to be a part of the community uh, whenever I come back to visit. And so it's, I think it's very much on point with one of the remarks that you just made in terms of um, coming back. And so this is uh, obviously a crystal ball kind of question because who knows exactly what the future will hold for you and how many opportunities are going to be given after you graduate from law school. But do you do you think that there is a possibility in your mind where you may actually come back to to live and work in our region? Yes, I certainly hope so. Uh, if the pandemic has taught me anything, it's really hard to plan and, uh, both short term and long term. And so even the opportunities that I've been presented with working at EDA and also working with my congressman uh, weren't planned at all. Uh, many perspectives these weren't opportunities I even applied for. Uh, the door really opened in a way that was intentional. Uh, I met the right people, the right mentors, the right connections, and the timing just worked out such that I was able to pursue these opportunities. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I didn't follow uh, the four-year plan I had set for myself going into college. I was going to take me straight to law school. Um, in this experience, this real-world experience has given me a lot of perspective and insights to take to Harvard. Uh, and share with others who may not be familiar with the border region. Uh, and after law school, I do hope to uh, practice as an attorney in Texas. I graduate Texas is a very big state, but I also believe there's a lot we can do, a lot of advocacy that's done at the state level in Austin. Um, so whether it's Austin or El Paso, um, I will be an ambassador for the border flex. I'll continue to be a champion for my community wherever I am. Okay, thank All you right. for so I think. Thank you for indulging me with that. That, um, but I think um, if anything, perhaps uh, the takeaway will be that you all are reinvigorated and you want to continue working for your communities um, in the passionate way that you do because I think that's how Brother Eagle works. And so, also, I I expect big things of him. So we all can say that we knew Brother Eagle at one point when he was only twenty four, and he just the last story is that he. Um, we talked about the pros and cons of renting versus using your own vehicle for work. And he pointed out to me that he doesn't even have that option because he's not 25 yet to rent a car. <laughs> so, you know, that put things into perspective. So anyway, but thank you. That That's that's all we have for this agenda item. Thank you, Ned. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so now we move on to item number three, which is the uh, Texas Department of Transportation. We'll be presented by Ned. Yes, sir. And so we do have with us today uh, Barracuda um, uh, Public Relations as well as Text Dot um, El Paso office. Um, Adriana, I always forget the last name, Rodriguez. Yes, and uh, Mr. Boga Negra. And so they just want to talk about this multimodal study. Um, they need our feedback, our input. And so um, if you want to come up and talk a little bit about that. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Montefice. I work with Therapeuta Public Relations. We're part of the consulting team that's working with TechStat on the six county multimodal uh, study that we're currently uh, undertaking. We're doing this with uh, HMTB, the uh, engineering firm out of El Paso as well. Um, and the last four days, we've been out here conducting listening sessions. Uh, we had some great meetings with folks in, uh, in Presidio and Alpine, Marfa. Uh, Sierra Blanca, Van Horn, um, today we're here in Valentine. We got to meet Summer yesterday and, and gather her, her input and knew that her grandbaby was, was on the way. So she was <laughs> slightly distracted, but it had some good uh, input for us. But um, the reason we're here is because good input and your insight into the communities that you represent is really important in, in, in the study. So um, in your packets, you have a QR code, and I think it was flashed up on Yes, we'll have right here. A QR code to the, to the survey, uh, because really the way that you all, that we connect with each other, uh, the way that, you know, think about sidewalks to schools, uh, bicycles, folks with ADA uh, uh, requirements. Uh, we heard a lot about areas that don't have cell phone service. And wouldn't that be nice to have some signage to for that? Um, we heard about areas that don't have enough lighting. Um, you know, things like that. That's the kind of input that we're looking to gather. Well, 
And the more specific you are, the more impactful your feedback will be. So please get in there and drop some pins and, and, and take the time to, to provide us the, the feedback. Our project manager is Adriana Rodriguez and she'll tell you all about uh, the project and why it's Well, good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, always a pleasure. This study is so important because we're able to break down in segments. This is a six county multiple and I know that I that going to meet a couple of you. Uh, and, and it also ties into maybe future grants. So in the discussion, we kind of learned about like uh, Marina said, the buses, the, the system, the, the dead zones, how important it is. And so pass it along. Uh, we started with the city of county. Uh, first meeting was there, and we're gathering the information. So the more information we have, more details we have, it's going to help us. But I, I also wanted to remind everyone: I'm going to continue coming out down here to visit. We had a successful transportation alternatives health projects. We had 17 applications in the El Paso district, and from those, there's 14 in the running. And so I'm excited. Looking forward, we'll probably here at the end of October. We'll get a status on this project. So. Um, again, fill out that survey. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to All right. Thank you so much for your time. What is the deadline for the, the survey? The deadline for the survey, we think we can get um, 30 days. Yeah, 30 days because we're still going to continue our visit. So, you know, pass it along on anyone. I know that we haven't had much time with the school districts. I know we had one school district show to our group, but school districts, any sidewalks, anything that the kids are struggling to get to school, all of that is definitely not questions? questions? Yes, uh, and you know, like, and we can to the study, it's just really going to be an open, but there's future grants that we can also later on reach out to and say, okay, there's a 20% match with all of this this type of grant, but there's also safety projects that so it kind of is going to help break way for future projects. That's a fair of obviously gonna you know a lot of times we have all these other programs, PA, HSIC, Vivid, on the other portal studies, and you know a lot of these little parts that you're mentioning are going to the point. You know, we're kind of looking at this like an exercise, not really a study. You know, we want to be able to provide Process to give people as many people requesting, not necessarily put them in the plan to shelter the way it's out there. But in order to do that, we need your comments. So um, I know many of us are in our soapbox and talks for engineers, but we need this. So when we have those comments, we can get back to the, that's the focus we want to talk That's when we can actually show that it's, it does want to partner with us, yes, he guidance. And that's very important. So as you said, please take this in. Please let us know when you want me to Because then that's when we can go back and actually have the I can send that to you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item for it will also be presented by Ms. Gutierrez. Yes, and um, I wanted to present Mark Absuela to the group. He's the new city administrator for Banhorn. Uh, he previously served as a county auditor. Uh, he could not join us today, but uh, Judge Urias was just going to mention a few things. I believe that he cheesed out. <laughs> and he's not in London. He's in Banhorn. <laughs> and since he's not here, he's 44 years old and weighs. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark will do the job for the city. He has worked alongside three county judges that span 23 or 23 years. He has a drop of experience. He had a good thing in the past. Uh, yes, I was Pacific Classic. Pacific Waters in the past with what he did. And probably after the more money, got more money. <laughs> Hornet's Man in, in, in Landhorn, just like it was when we saw uh, a Paso City manager go down in flames, and he shouldn't have, by the way. But either way, that's that's it. Yeah, here, there. He will fare well. He'll do a good job. Uh, send him a message, an email, stop by and say hi. Congratulations. Good night.
Thank you. Thank you, Judge. You it's now we move on to um, item number five. And again, uh, it's a text legislative update presented by Mr. Jeffs. Yes. And so this could be a very long one. It's up to Cassandra how she wants to summarize that for you. But uh, Cassandra Ruthia, uh, Legislative and District Director for Senator Cesar Blanco, is going to give us an update on the uh, past activities. All right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. To the familiar faces and the new ones. It's good to be here with you all and back home for the last 140 days. We've been in a legislative session of the box. So we're finally able to come back and share some of our wins. Um, Senator Blanco has expressed about being able to, to be here, but we did want to make sure that we were present and uh, able to provide, provide a recap of so on behalf of the Senator, thank you all for having me. Um, as many of you all are aware, the session usually lasts 140 days, but due to the differing ideas of how the state should address property taxes this go around, um, it has been a topic of many conversations lately. Uh, we've been in session a little bit longer than the usual. So, we're going to start there on where we are with property taxes and how things panned out this last um, the second special session. And so across the, the state, working families and small businesses have struggled with skyrocketing, skyrocketing property taxes. So going into this session, delivering economic relief to families and small businesses was the legislature's number one priority, especially with the combination of inflation and costs right across the city, that was a number one focus for, for many legislators. Um, and we're gonna take that as, as long as, as we need to help them. So finally, on July 14th, the Texas legislature tried to die for the third time um, from a, a second call special session after a month's long stale, stalemate on property tax issues. Senator Blongo proudly co-authored and helped pass the historic group property tax package to deliver real economic relief to homeowners, renters, and small businesses with the largest property tax cut in Texas history. With the legislation, homeowners will save on an average of $1,300, well, take that $1,370 every year, while over 60,000 homeowners in El Paso and West Texas can pay $0 in local school district property taxes. Moreover, this package will effectively eliminate franchise tax for over 67,000 small to medium-sized businesses in our community by doubling the state franchise tax exemption. With the package is over $12 billion in state funding to better compensate school districts and reduce school property tax rates, an increase in the school district homestead exemption from $40,000 to $100,000, a 20% circuit breaker, which is essentially an appraisal tax, the appraised value for non non homestead apartments is valued at five million dollars. Additionally, the bill allows for new apartments. However, the important piece of current uh, tax relief and guaranteeing public school, school dollars is ensuring that that money stays within the community, right? That it's serving. And so, one of the other pieces of legislation that we did really heavily push this last session was school dollars. And so that. That's why Senator Blanco was adamant, adamantly opposed uh, the school voucher bill to make sure that that money is staying in the district. Um, so going into this session, delivering economic relief to families, small businesses. Oh, hold on. <laughs> um, so that's why he, he opposed the, the school voucher bill. In addition to the historic progress made to provide property taxes, more taxes, recession. Um, the, the session also yielded awesome um, accomplishments, legislative accomplishments. As many of you know, Texas had a significant budget surplus of nearly $33 billion going into the session. The Texas legislature ultimately passed uh, House Bill 1, which is our state's budget, of $321.3 billion. It was a bipartisan spending plan for the next two years. This includes over $17 billion of additional surplus money to bolster the state's mental health care system, energy security, provide property tax cuts, pay employees 
salad phrases, body phrases, transition phrases, and money to provide raw diagnosis with water infrastructure slash budget. Notably within the budget are several of Senator Blanco's local priority items that will impact many of the communities that you all serve. There's 50 million for um, an investment in redesigning and constructing the El Paso Psychiatric Center. This will help expand access to critical mental health services for adults and youth in our community, which is sorely lacking right now. $65 million investment to construct the El Paso Cancer Center, which is going to be a first in its kind for the sick cancer treatment facility in Far West Texas. $40 million for the Permian Basin Behavioral Health Center. $10 million more for Weiler Tramway. $5 million for Wayward Tank. A million for improvements at Valmoray State Park. Seven point two for McDonald's Observatory, which is just right around the corner. Thirty-six million for grants to agricultural landowners impacted by damages to their land and their businesses in the progress of illegal activities like human trafficking, drug trafficking, and bailouts. Five million for grants to assist micro businesses and access to capital loans for disaster recovery. Ten million to fund the leaky water wells program to plug up damaged oil wells in. Uh, in Pico County, a million for the Colonia set aside program to help our Colonia residents access uh, connectivity to the internet, There's a 200,000 of economic development support. In addition, the budget also includes several statewide wins. There was 2.3 billion to raise base for the personal care community attendance through the Medicaid program to help patients with tasks like laundry, errands, grooming, cleaning, and medication. 1.8 billion for state employee raises, a billion for, to fund critical water projects in tiny areas, which I'll talk more about in just a little bit about that legislation. 1.5 for broadband development, 9.4 billion for mental health services, including funding for mental health community hospitals, mental health state hospital operations, and community mental health grant programs. 44.7, 44.7. 447.2 million for women's health programs and family planning programs. 178.2 million for rural hospitals, including increased funding for rural labor and labor delivery networks. Uh, there was also about the college uh, funding system. Uh, community college funding system and increase access to higher education. A few of the major bills that Senator Blanco passed this session in House Bill 1287. This one was a critical one called the, the Staff Equal Asset Test Bill. Um, this, what it does is it increases the amount that is taken into consideration for an individual's bar value when they're being considered for SNAP eligibility, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, so that they can receive food assistance. So it adjusted those super outdated uh, values. And so it's going to help more folks keep their SNAP benefits and put food on the table. House Bill 113 is community health worker access. And so it allows Medicaid to reimburse for our community health workers and our Pomodonas that have such a big part in our community. And then there's Senate Bill 1133 to provide the farmers and ranchers the financial assistance for the property damage for border related crimes. We also held past bills that will address local concerns. When our office visits with the county of far west, we often hear about how low population density, great geographic distances, and relative isolation from major population centers make emergency medical services expensive and challenging. Access to EMS, especially out here in the rural areas, in the life of the life of death. Um, and so that's why we did work with and, and a group of folks over in El Paso County and Hudson County to pass um, Senate Bill 1526. Oh, this one's specific to the law. 1526 allows Big Bend Regional Hospital District to provide EMS services, which is not something that they were able to before. We also passed that as Senate Bill 1588 to bolster EMS workforce. And so, what this allows them to do is have a certified driver in the front. So before they had to have two um, certified EMS folks in the ambulance, and now they can have a certified driver and the, the certified person in the back 
providing the care. And so that has helped quite a few of our rural areas to be supported with PMS personnel. Uh, to continue supporting our military installations and their families, we passed F 1524 to allow PEPSPOT to enter into agreements with military installations so that they can provide resources for roads and uh, fences and other basic transportation project needs. Additionally, many ranchers in far west have been plagued by the environmental crisis caused by abandoned water wells. We're seeing this quite a bit in Kansas County. To address this issue, we passed House Bill 4236, which creates the Leaky Water Wells Program to help finance the plugging of water wells to assist landowners mitigating the wells' harmful impact on the environment and on their land. Um, currently, there wasn't anybody that had oversight over those abandoned wells, so the state had to step back and the ranchers to figure out how to fund those that plugging. So The tap water that we water to our crops, water, and life blood that each part of the city. That's why Senator Blanco is working to deliver new water supplies to help our region grow and thrive. This session, Senator Blanco co authored and helped pass Senate Bill 28 to create the Texas Water Fund and the new water supply for Texas funds to improve water security for far less Texas communities and their families. The bill will invest the billion dollars to upgrade state aging water infrastructure and pipes to increase the same water supply, especially in rural communities and have Texas on the map to improve the water temperature for generations to come. And to ensure that the communities are directly impacted by groundwater resources are involved in the process, Senator Blanc will have HB 3278, which makes the process more transparent and easier for stakeholders to be engaged so that they can tell. Us what they're doing. Additionally, Senator Blanco's House has joint authored and passed out statewide legislation to improve the extent of coverage for moms up to 12 months, enacting stronger measures to ensure safety and security in our public school, establishing a grant program to provide a, uh, financial assistance to raise pay rates for sheriff's um, offices and their prosecutors' offices, constables' offices, and rural communities to ensure a safer community for our families. Increased funding for nursing scholarships and loan repayment programs that will help draw more folks out to the rural areas, provide that necessary medical care, and finally giving our retired teachers a boost so that they can live comfortably in their retirement. Overall, Senator Blanco is immensely proud of the work that we were able to accomplish in the session. Thank you all so much for the folks in this room that drove all the way out to Austin to our testimony. It's amazing. Now, Devin, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, with that, there's still plenty of work left to do. We know that. And this is really the start of it. Coming out of the legislative session, getting right back into legislative vote, we know that we still have a lot left to address. So we look forward to working with you all, continuing these partnerships, figuring out what your true needs are, getting a, a real plan in place so that we can go into the next session ready to go. Um, if anyone needs additional information on the information provided, then feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions. It's great to be here with you all. Thank you again for everything. Thank you. Senator, thank you for allowing me to testify and helping you, helping you get things down. Anybody have any questions? Questions? I know it's a lot of information, so I'll leave cards at the front or I'll, I'll pass them out. But um, and I'll also give you all my cell phone number. That's the quickest way to reach me since I'm still between El Paso and Austin. So my cell phone number 915-787-9202. If you need anything, feel free to text me, give me a call, questions on the implementation bills, anything like that. I know there's a lot of change on the horizon, so we're here to answer any questions you have. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number six, we move on to item number six. And that, all, that will also be presented by Ms. Davis. Yes, I am asking for board approval to allow the council governments to enter into an agreement with the Water Finance Exchange 
um, organization. And what, what their purpose is, is to assist cities, counties, water districts with um, accessing funding. Uh, and that's coming primarily from state and federal agencies. And so these folks out of this uh, nonprofit organization have a wealth of experience with uh, the staff persons that they're utilizing, some of formerly from Water Development Board, um, others have operated water systems. And um, we previously had the uh, entered into agreement with El Paso County to um, offer uh, technical assistance, grant writing services for uh, water districts and cities to be able to tap into the um, infrastructure bill monies that were made available. And through this initiative, us using an additional support unit I think it's just going to make us that much more effective in drawing down some of these funds. And so we do have the agreement for you uh, to review. And if allowed, um, if you all approve, then we'll go ahead and enter into that agreement. And then we'll start working with Water Finance Exchange in a much more um, robust level than we have as of today. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I was going to ask if anybody had any questions. Legal, legal work. Uh, Miss Todd, um, is, are we? Everything looks in accordance with the agreement. Yes, and I think this is an organization that works with um, with the county. county. Yes. Yes. So there's been a, a motion to approve and seconded by Judge Evans. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. And I'm done with my agenda. Oh, one more, no, one more. Oh, one more. Oh, one more. Right. So sorry. We move to item number seven. Yes. I just wanted to inform everyone that um, there has been a coalition that's been formed uh, through the University of Texas at El Paso, as well as the El Paso Community Foundation. There are going to be, again, a significant amount of funding coming down um, through the in, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And so these monies um, primarily will be coming through Environmental Protection Agency. This coalition that's been formed uh, with many organizations are looking at how they're going to be approaching, applying for the funding, um, since many of them are requiring a coalition to be uh, formed. And so wanted to inform you of that as well, but then also the coalition is looking at expanding beyond El Paso County. So if our other areas are interested in participating in this initiative. Uh, the Council of Governments can be the vehicle for that. Uh, we're assuming that there's probably going to be something similar to the um, identification of uh, anyone being on the border 150 miles from there would be eligible. And so we could essentially have all of our communities eligible for that funding. And so if you all are interested, let me know. Um, I'll be providing you that information. And, and if you want to be on board with the, the application, um, that's something that they can do as well. Any questions? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Oh yes, I keep wanting to sit down, but I can't. Now we move, now we move over to item number eight. So on number eight, this is our public investment fund report. This is what we provide on a quarterly basis to you all. This is an information item only. Um, you do have the information in front of you, so. Uh, I'll just be brief in informing you that this is what our snapshot looks like for the last quarter uh, for our operating account. The next one is for our um, TCEQ, or this is for CSEC for the 911 program. And then the next one here is for our Texas Commission on Environmental Quality uh, in terms of where the market value is, book value, and what it is currently um, in terms of an interest that's been earned. Are there any questions for me on these items? before I move on and let Marisa go. <laughs> no, no questions. Now we okay. move to item number nine and it's commission on state of emergency communications and it'll be, be, be presented by Ms. Marisa Quintanilla. Good morning, Board of Directors, Marisa Quintanilla, Regional Services Director. I wanted to provide you an update uh, from one of our fund sources, our funding agency, the commission, on state emergency communications. This is the agency, state agency, that provides us the dollars to support the PSAP, the public safety entry points, to ensure that the 911 call is delivered to that PSAP. Um, 
we have to go ahead and submit our strategic plan for the next biennium, which is um, 24 and 25. Within that strategic plan, I requested funding from um, Hudson County all the way to, uh, to Brewster County for uh, oblique and orthal imagery. So basically flyovers um, to be able to capture um, our, our geographical areas in the city. So we received 1.5 million to go ahead and do the flyover. And uh, for the cities, the resolution will be three inches and for the counties it will be six inches. So when somebody asks for a 911 address that actually our 911, uh, our GIS coordinators, Casey and Aaron, they can go ahead and uh, get that um, imagery and really drill down to that location. We will be also sharing this imagery with our CAC, uh, with the appraisal districts. And so um, that is something that many times CATs don't, with the exception of Culberson County, uh, <laughs> don't have the funds to be able to do the flyovers. So we hope to accomplish this. We will accomplish this by the end of fiscal year 24. So I just wanted to give you an update regarding the imagery. The second piece of that was added to the strategic plan um, is actually a street sign maker machine. Uh, we, uh, it is allowed for us to purchase the sign and the materials, not the sign, the, the machine, it's cut, uh, to go ahead and make the street signs and then and the materials to make those street signs. The jurisdictions would be responsible for the poles and the brackets and the installation of those signs. Um, so we got a, we received about fifty thousand dollars because there's you know a computer there's like the workman's uh, station that needs to be purchased the film and then the cutter um, so that would probably about fifty thousand dollars is going to be the cost um, that the cutter the, the machine will be placed at the city of Presidio our GIS um, technician Jesus Mosillo will be making those streets signs and our first jurisdiction that uh, will be provided with new signs will be the city of Pacific. We just ramped up a huge initiative where we actually renamed over 150 streets in the city of Pacific, where they have duplicate um, or similar street names. So an example, you had a street with the numerical first, and then you had another street with the spelled out first. So for emergency response, it's true, very, very true confusion for them to say, which street are we going to go to? We, we had a lot of Rosedale Avenue, Rosedale Lane, and so eliminated a lot of those duplications. So a huge and, and great congratulations to City of Presidio. Um, we had an addressing committee, a street addressing committee, and then Casey and Jesus that actually um, took that initiative on. So. Those are the two updates in regards to the uh, Commission on State Emergency Communications. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, just a comment. Uh, they have been a godsend when it seems it's so confusing 911 so it didn't exist, let alone Amazon or FedEx. That, that was a that was a, a backstrop, right? But uh, these guys have really committed themselves, they've come a long way. We truly appreciate it. I think it's going to be great. And I think you're implying that this this equipment, once we get spun up, uh, hopefully you guys will be come reaching out to us if you need assistance like that, worn out, beat up, run over signs, and you need them replaced, uh, we'll be able to, to give back to our neighbors. So, but thank you so very much. I appreciate it. So it is a regional letter, sign machine. Um, once we have City of Presidio up and running, anybody else within the region that needs a street sign, just let us know, contact us, and then you just have to go and pick it up at the city. Because that's where the machine will house. Yeah, I think Mayor Ferguson is already trying to break down the walls of this. It's going to be a huge thing. It's, it's not a, a, a huge problem. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's a no action item. So we move on to item number 10. Right. Also presented by Ms. Gubini. Board of Directors just wanted to go ahead and invite you to a TDM day, which is the Texas Emergency Management Division. Um, they're going to go ahead and uh, provide a uh, a workshop. It's going to be in Van Horn in Culberson County, August 30th at 10 o'clock. 
We're starting at 10, 10 to 2.30, I believe. Uh, behind your agenda item is the schedule. You can meet some RSVPs um, between um, TM staff, Rio Grande Cog staff, and I think there's going to be some other um, agencies that are going to be presenting information in terms of, um, you know, what's happening with, with emergency management and then also with some new initiatives in terms of portals for reporting incidents and so forth. Uh, Council of Governments will be announcing um, our new grant for the uh, CERT program training, which is the Community Emergency Response Teams. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and have that initiative um, roll up in September, September 1, October 1, for fiscal year 24. And just to be able to have those uh, community uh, emergency response teams put together in the region should there be some type of emergency. We do our risk repeat, so I do because there's going to be much provided. So please, there, I think the information get with me or just uh, uh, with Amber, either one, and so we can go ahead and get a head count for lunch. No questions? Thank you, Ms. Kitania. I will move on to the area of aging, agency of on aging, uh, Ms. Oh, there she is. Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, but before we before Yvette starts, just wanted to just acknowledge this is a very very um, important function for the area agency on aging. They've been working on it for quite some time. So I think Yvette's tremendously excited to get to this point where um, she's asking for approval for the plan and. Uh, just wanted to recognize her and her staff for all of their work. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that I'm up here to ask for approval of stuff. Sometimes I feel like I know everything about our other cog departments, and sometimes you don't know a lot about, about our staff. But basically, coming before you all this morning to request your approval for a spittal of our 2024 and 2026 area plan. Um, this is something that's required of area agencies on aging uh, by the Older Americans Act. So, uh, there, there's several components to the Older Americans Act that really govern what it is that area agencies are supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to be providing and connecting to older adults in our regions. And so this plan is something that we have prepared and worked on. I have presented this to our advisory council. They have made favorable recommendations to present to you all for your consideration of approval so that I can then send it to our state office in Austin. Uh, they are considered the state unit on aging. That's what's recognized by the federal government, the Health and Human Services Commission, Office of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, the 28 area agencies on aging across our state are required to put these plans together. They compile them into one plan and then send it up to the federal government, uh, the administration for community and living. And so behind your agenda item, you'll see the presentation that is here that we'll go over uh, just for information. So basically, this. this the planning document for us is something that we are proposing to put together that says what it is that we're going to be providing in our region. And so we identify things like service planning, budget development, uh, what services staff of the area agency and agency will be providing, what vendors will be purchasing or the types of services that vendors will be purchasing from, our coordination with community partners, any collaboration with local uh, service providers in the region, and that we're complying with older Americans Act requirements. What's of most significance here, and this is kind of based on what the summary that I put together here that you see in some of the statistics, because it really looks at it requires us to look at the makeup and demographic of our region, projections and population planning for older adults, et cetera. Um, and so I took that approach with this plan to ensure that we are in fact complying with the targeting areas of the older Americans Act. In this case, you see here that are uh, we should be serving persons of greatest uh, lowest greatest economic need or low income, uh, persons with limited English proficiency, minority status, residents of rural areas or isolated areas in the, in the region, and those at risk for institutionalization. So you can imagine that this is where the Older Americans Act first started and is asking us to look at those kinds of populations. It's clearly there's not enough funding to support all of the needs of older adults, right? So these targeting areas are where they're asking to look at. However, my premise in looking at our region's demographic and makeup is really in reality, our region is all of this. Think about it, really break down and we'll look at the statistics here in a bit. That is our region. We have these kinds of population of older adults that are residing 
And clearly we know in El Paso County, that is the majority of older adult population, uh, the majority is, right? But we recognize the other five counties in our service region as well. We had some great conversation last night about older adults and how in the region out here, we'll just see the age in place, right? So out here, the young folk leave, don't necessarily come back per se, and leave older adults out here to age in place. There's such, there's such a need limited resources that makes it challenging for us to be able to provide equity or an equal amount of types of assistance within the region. The next slide. So looking at that, this is the premise for how I basically describe our region is that. And these next slides with the statistics show that, and hopefully you'll, you'll agree with me as well. So looking at the statistics, the uh, most recent survey would be the 2025-2019 American Community Survey conducted by the census. So this is where these numbers are coming from. We're looking at persons 60 years of age and older within this entire region. So clearly, as I stated, El Paso County has the bulk of older adults. But our regions make up, we have about 162,321 older adults in our region. As you can see, El Paso County has those, uh, the bulk of it. But this is where that challenge is for being able to provide equal amount or at least um, attempt to serve all the older adults in our region. So that does create a disparity for us. Scarcity-wise, the largeness of our region does make that a little difficult for us. The next slide is the gender distribution. And this is important for us because we think about the makeup of older adults. And this is generally a phenomenon. We know that women tend to live a little bit longer lives, so that uh, gives us more of women that are residing in our region. Particularly here, we're showing that 56% of the older adult population are women, 44% are, are men. And so what that does for us is it has to, we have to examine the life earning expectancy of women um, because they are usually less likely to have earned um, similar incomes or were not, not in the workforce as long per se, especially when we look at these older adults. Demographics start to change when we're thinking about baby boomers and some of us coming up we are looking at our older adult populations, those that are 75, 80, less likely to have been in the workforce, perhaps, and so they have lower lifetime earnings. What that does means that they're less likely to receive a pension. So when they become widowed, that gives them less earnings, you know, less income when they were perhaps both, their you know, spouse was alive, they were both bringing in uh, income. And so that does place a great increased burden on us then being able to provide assistance to them because they are more likely to require that type of assistance. Again, premise with the area agencies on aging, we want to help people stay out of institutions in their communities residing uh, for as long as possible. So that's the burden that's placed on us to be able to then provide for those needs and services. And here clearly, again, showing that our, our the women in our region, the one parent population number there, so that is again another showing that we're going to have to do much more to help support our older adult women. And women. The next slide, well, these are those for persons aged 85 and older. So we know statistically that persons 85 years of age older are more likely to require additional supports and services to help keep them in their homes, right? So again, there's that increased burden. In our region, we have approximately 12,000 persons who are considered old age 85 years and older that live in our region. Okay, clearly a class of 20 has both of them, but still they are throughout the region. So again, we're looking at projections of a 5% increase every year of that number increasing. We're living longer. There's more support being put in place medically to help us age and, and live longer. So again, we know that that requires more support and services to stay at home. But also we're seeing that family caregivers of these people are older themselves and they have their own ailments. So again, it's not just a quick fix of saying, well, their daughter will take care of them. Also, they're probably dealing with their own issues. So again, another uh, place that this would be a challenge for us, but this is again, like a certain sect of our population that we really need to make sure we're still providing those support, supports and services to help them stay in their homes as well. Next slide, please. Another significant factor for us is our poverty level here in our region. Poverty here, we're looking at statistics of people who are considered 100% below the at or below the poverty level. That's the cutoff for us. Um, in the sense that they ask for this. 
Broken down here, our region is about 26,275 persons, or 18% of our region is considered poverty. However, to note that Escipio County is considered 44.9% persons at or below the poverty level. So you're thinking about that. Again, both in El Paso County, but you think about Presidio County itself, and they're at a much higher poverty level rate. So what that does for us, again, knowing that we are serving people with a limited, limited income, here, but that does place that increased burden on helping them to qualify for state public funded assistance, which sometimes isn't easy given different um, factors within our, our region, even though they are considered public status. For some people, private pay services is the other alternative, but if you are poverty stricken, you can't afford private pay in home care. So that's something also. And again, as much as we would like to be able to help everyone, can't you just don't have the funding for so difficulties there and then of course government entities you all know it's difficult to raise taxes or increase anything else to place burdens on again people who are living in poverty so we are clearly serving a poverty uh in area within the name of the next slide is looking at the minority population of our region and here you can see clearly the there are four counties within our region that are considered Hispanic minority, Hispanic majority minority, right? So those four being uh, El Paso, Presidio, Culberson, and Texas counties are racially Hispanic makeup. There's um, very few, uh, some of the other minority groups are kind of similar in that sense, but not as much as the Hispanic uh, number of older adults. Think about the total percentage of our older adult minority population we are actually at 79.89% minority status within the region. Um, so for me, this supports that we are in fact serving minority populations here. In Jeff Davis and Costa counties, they are, like the majority are white people. However, there is still population pockets of older adult Hispanic um, population. So again, this tells me, and this to me paints the picture that we are in fact serving those people. This next slide, also goes to the connecting persons who have limited English proficiency. When we look at languages spoken in the home, this shows us those factors here. In our region, the statistic is that homes in the region that speak languages other than English is 75, 75.1%. The statewide average is 34.9%. So our region clearly, we speak another English, that, or another language than English. Given the minority makeup, the assumption can be made, obviously, that that's Spanish. And so looking at that, Presidio County actually has the highest population or percentage, if you will, of foreign languages spoken in the world. And so clearly we see, again, this limited English proficiency requirement of the Older Americans Act that we're, in fact, serving those groups of people here in our region. So our, our region really was the, was the largest region in the state landmass. Right. Again, population-wise, El Paso County has the majority of it, the rest of the region, but the land mass-wise, it makes it difficult for us to ensure that we're getting to everyone that we need to get to, right? So those, the population density make up here, clearly there's more people in El Paso County than in the region, that, that's a given. But the services is what makes it a little harder for us. El Paso County, obviously, we have access to many different services and supports compared to the region. So we really try our best to preserve those services like our nutrition programs out here, the transportation programs, the few home health vendors that we have that can provide the in-home supportive services that people might need. So we, we try our very, very best to make sure that those contracts are up and running and that we can back support people. Needing to make frequent visits out here. Again, it still pains me that we had to close our satellite office in Martha. And you know, we are trying our very best to make sure we get out here with more frequency, that people are reminded that we're still here and available for them to support their needs. And eventually, you know, Ned and I discussed this. We we may have to look at this again because clearly the largeness of this, we need a presence out here as well. So, you know, those are future plans, if you will. Um, but that's something that that we're looking at when we think about the needs of older adults. So I hope that those statistics. You'll agree with me and say, I think we're serving and proposing to serve all of those targeting areas of the Older Americans Act that are required to pass of us, just based on those statistics. And so the next slide is looking at uh, the needs and priorities. 
Another survey that was conducted by Health and Human Services, which is the Aging Texas Well Initiative, looked at some of the needs of older adults, family caregivers, and support um, service providers that work in service to older adults. And the identified need, they asked us to look at what they've identified and compare that to our region and see if there are similar services that are, or, or needs well, that are required. So for older adults, the biggest thing that came up for them was, of course, their physical health, access to those services and support to the community, and whether there are social engagement opportunities for them. And this was really big with the pandemic. Obviously, we know that affected older adults, you know, isolated so many older adults, lost so many to because of that, because of the isolation and not being able to interact with, with people with depression, et cetera. Um, so that was probably why I could say that came up as, as a huge need for older adults. For family caregivers, and those are persons defined as you know, you're physically caring for your age group. Sometimes culture has just assumed that's what we do, but for family caregivers, we recognize that they are truly the backbone of our healthcare system and that helping keep their loved ones in home without having to institutionalize them, helping those uh, healthcare providers have great care plans because they're the ones administering the medications, the therapy, et cetera. So family caregivers are so important, but we need to support them because they, in fact, then are twice as likely to suffer from uh, ailments or illnesses because they're focused on the needs of their loved ones. And so for caregivers, mental health is a big issue, their own physical health, and then work strains. If you are still working and caring for a loved one, the difficulties of having to balance that and manage maybe needing to have frequent leave or absences from work and issues that can come up with that uh, with employees. And then service providers working in service holder adults, the collaboration, coordination, funding, staffing, addressing food insecurity, and of course supporting family caregivers are also big issues. So looking at those things and reviewing some of our data that we have, the calls that we receive, the access that we have to our 211 provider, that's the social services uh, call line. If you have a question, you can dial 211 and ask for assistance. I was able to access that information, kind of their common most frequent requests. The staff actually asking them, what is it that you're seeing? What are you hearing? What are people telling you? And then, of course, historical data, looking at what have we spent the most funds on, what have people asked for the most help with, concludes that we have the same needs. These are kind of a given. So the statewide needs match, mirror our region, some a little more predominant than others, but for the most part, we can surmise that there is a similarity in what the state plan looked at versus what was happening in our region. So because of that, we're supporting what we're currently doing. We've added two new services to continue to support the needs. For these next few slides, direct services will continue to provide information, referral, and assistance. Our case management services, that is then working directly with those older adults or family caregivers, having staff visit with them in their homes to see what the needs are. How can we best assist you with either our services or connecting you to those resources in the community um, to find a longer term solution? Our benefits counseling services, where we look at just benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps, et cetera, that those staff members literally help someone access whatever is there and assess to where maybe perhaps you didn't realize or think you could qualify for something, letting us help you with those services. Evidence-based programs in that when we teach um, health and wellness classes right now, our focus is on fall prevention. We know that recognize that fall, falls in older adults are one of the leading causes of emergency relation and the problems that can happen. Our long-term care ombudsman services, where we physically go into the nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and serve as the eyes and ears, the advocate for those residents who feel that they perhaps cannot complain or that they are nervous about saying that they're not comfortable with some of the care that they're receiving. We are not the investigators, but we certainly can act in capacity of serving as a mediator between those facility staff. The two new services that we're proposing to add go back to supporting our family caregivers. And this is caregiver training, um, education, and then information services. This looks at specifically trying to assist our family caregivers in either helping them learn about the disease process of their loved one, helping them learn coping strategies, stress management, uh, accepting that they are in fact a caregiver themselves is a huge component for us. And then of course, just continuing that education and support so that they can continue to do their job of providing care for their loved ones. 
As far as purchase services, we're going to continue the same services that we had in the past. Our meals program, Congregate Home Delivered, the in home supportive services of personal assistance, homemaker, and respite care. Thank you, Sandra, Cassandra, for that vote on helping to increase that wage. That has been a difficult problem with us. We have funding to support that service, and yet those home health providers are having such a hard time finding and retaining those in home providers because of. And so we're hoping that strategies like that will encourage these home health agencies or entities to pay their providers more so that they can actually retain good providers and help provide that assistance. Uh, our day activity health services, uh, these are those adult daycares. Of course, we don't have them out in the region. Of the county that we do, that's also considered a form of respite for our caregivers. Transportation, residential repair, and health maintenance. So in a nutshell, and my <laughs> life for the last four months, has been this plan. Um, and I'm sorry if I rush through that, I feel like I'm always the last one and y'all are ready to head out on the road. Um, but this is really the, the bulk of our work that we've done for many, many years to support that, any work that we could expand or provide that assistance. I know we're truly looking and hoping that here in, in Jeff Davis County, Fort Davis, that we get that community center up and running and start a, a senior center and congregate continue the home to the reviews program. So these are things that are all in the works and plan and want to assure you that your area agents and agent is here to continue to provide those services and supports. But I do need your your confidence and vote in my plan so that I can forward that out to our state office for their approval. So with that said, this is a action item. Do I have a motion to approve? Oh we have a question. Oh you okay. oh, sorry. sorry sorry to get away. Thank you. I appreciate that. Most on the draw. <laughs> Motion made to approve by Representative Fierro, seconded by Judge Evans. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. All right. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Might as well remain. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good job. We move on to uh, item number 12, also presented by Mr. Lugo. Yes, thank you. This is informational only. Um, so of course, I typically when I come to you, it's to tell you to invite you to our Aging to Perfection uh, Expo. Um, this, this year it's scheduled for August 23rd, the 22nd annual event that we host is at the Alpaca Convention Center from 9 to 2, a one-day event. It's a very large-scale health fair, educational fair, fair, informational fair, screenings, um, etc. And so everyone is invited. I know that we have this in El Paso County, but Feel like coming up, those out those out here want to come up and visit for the day, maybe attend. We'd love to see you. Um, I'm happy to announce that we have seventeen thousand dollars in sponsorship. And so again, this event for us is also a way for us to, to draw down in kind support so that we can uh, provide that as proof to draw down the funds from the federal government. And so the event for us um, is is a way to show that in kind support by the community. There is a fee to participate as a as a as a vendor. It's free to the public. Um, we solicit sponsorships to help pay for advertising, and the booths help pay for the venue. So we've got seventeen thousand dollars sponsorship, one five thousand dollars sponsor, two twenty five hundred, and seven one thousand dollars sponsor. It's all made up of, of any anyone who has anything to do with services support to older adults, like health friends, um, health care providers, insurance providers, um, health, health agencies, etc or typically who are sponsoring the event as well as participating. We're still working on our booths. Um, we anticipate, I think right now we've got about 40 booths at this point uh, signed up. Our goal is always to have about 79, 80 booths available. It, what usually happens is when advertising starts, when people realize that they want to participate, so they start coming in at that point. Um, we're currently working on that. We're still working to find a provider for flu shots, that is usually a big draw for us. Although I've heard that flu shots weren't being uh, made available until September, but some of our Walgreens swears that they have the corner on this market. So I'm still waiting to hear back from Walgreens if we can provide flu shots and those are free to the public. COVID shots and boosters will be provided by San Vicente Clinic and all hospitals. Um, so we're working on that. <laughs> Desert Imaging will be providing mammograms. There's so much readings and supports that are free for people who are in attendance. There's an educational component to that, and we have three speakers that will be presenting um, during certain times of the event. 
the Alzheimer's Association will be talking about the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes for some of us, we've got it because we can't find our keys. Oh gosh, I've got Alzheimer's. It's not that usual <laughs> to hear the 10 Thank warning God. signs. Something, you know, for some people it might be some, for some people it might be a reality check to say maybe we should consider getting checked. Um, the county attorney's office will be presenting on the transfer on death deed. That's something, if you've not heard of that, is an alternative to a will. For some people, having a will is not necessary if you have a transfer on death deed in place. So the county attorney's office will be presenting on that. And then the FBI El Paso office will be uh, presenting on the common scams and how to avoid them that afflict older adults. So it is a very purposeful event for us. We also have entertainment on the stage that are all older adults themselves to help remind us that aging does not mean that we are ill and fun and that we can't stay active in this way. So I invite you to join us if you can again, this information only. This is something that we are pride ourselves in doing for yes. It is, it really is. It's good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Lugo. Now we have the executive director's report. Um, yes, just there's a few items here that you can see in terms of activities that have been conducted um, since the last time we've met, but I just wanted to take this opportunity quickly to um, ask Peggy if she would like to um, remind everyone about the broadband um, presentation that's going to be happening by the uh, broadband development office from the comptroller's office, the date. Yes, I'll send it out and it's August the 8th, right? Or the 7th. Okay. Thank you. And then also just finally, again, if I can just uh, recognize the talents of management, um, you know, Marisa quickly presented to you with CSEC and the um, imagery they're going to be receiving. That's a big ask. Uh, we are a surcharge uh, council of governments where we ask for more money than we receive in 911. So that was a major coup for you all. And I know that there are many other applications that can be used for um, imagery. And so uh, thank you to Marisa for that. Yvette, thank you for the plan. Too late. She didn't hear, so it's okay. You're good, money stuff. So, um, and Yvette, again, just with the plan, the area plan, it's a big, big lift. And so we're really excited to um, just be able to reevaluate our services and see what else can be done for our older adults. So that is the conclusion of my presentation. The president's report, uh, soon to be. Would you like to say anything, President Yvette? <laughs> Thank y'all for being here. <laughs> right. okay. and, uh, and announcements. Do we, have, any... do, we, do we have any announcements? <laughs> Do we have any announcements? Anybody? No? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Okay. There you go. We have a motion in a second. We have a motion in a second. Motion made by Judge Evans and seconded by Judge Adios. All in favor? All right. All right. <laughs> any opposed? Motion carries. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone have a safe drive home. Good job, honey. Thank you. Thank you, sir.